Hello and welcome to the Defiance Open Metaverse NFT show. We're talking about entertainment today. We have the very amazing Stacey Spikes from MoviePass who has just an incredible tale to tell about that particular project. Stacey, amazing to have you on the show. We saw you in NFT NYC and we thought we've got to have you on the show. How are you? Hey, Robin, I'm good. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So MoviePass, it was yeah. a household name. It was your company. You are the CEO. But what a story. Tell me, I mean, give me the give me the guts of it. What what actually happened and and where were you amazing and where did it all go wrong? Well, let's see. So the high level, um, so Rigino found it back in 2011. Uh, me and my co-founder, Hame Watt. And, you know, the idea was, could we bring a Netflix type model to movie theaters? And um, you know, we, we started getting some good traction and got it up on its feet in 2012. And I was CEO up through 2016, 2017. And mid 2017, we got a buy offer from a private equity group. And one of the things that they wanted to do was kind of get a bump in attendance uh, in subscribers. And so they said, hey, we got an idea. Let's drop the price to $10. Um, and at this point I had moved to COO position and we had a CEO who had been at Netflix and, um, and this private equity group. And so we figured it could take a few months to get that additional hundred thousand. We dropped the price and then within 48 hours, we had a hundred thousand new, new subscribers. And, um, the, the, the company kind of split in two, uh, there was the originals, who were saying, you got to turn this off real fast because there's no way to be profitable at $10. And then you had the new owners in the new direction who were saying, isn't this great? Look how fast we're growing. And um, we all kind of know what happened. So I left the company in January of 18. So it was about six months after that purchase. And we, we kind of know what happened. The management changed, everything changed, the culture changed. And it just got driven right off a cliff. And in about 12 months after that, they were out of business. And um, last year, towards the end of last year, someone told me that the MoviePass assets were actually still available. And so I called up the bankruptcy court and lo and behold, it was true. And I put in a bid to buy everything back separate from the the parent company that had owned it at this point. And um, they they granted my my petition to buy it back. And uh, in November of last year, we we got everything back. So now we're going to relaunch it. It's an amazing story because I remember, well, I mean, my background is I was a filmmaker. Yeah. And, and, I, and I still am, but I now I, I talk on the internet instead. It's a different different model of doing things. But I have directed and produced a feature film. Oh. And, and, it, and so I know the pain of this business, the pain of getting bums on seats in theaters. And growing up, I, all I wanted to do was go to the, the cinema. I would watch yeah. anything. I would go and see anything. And it was so expensive. Yeah. It was so difficult to, to really justify spending that much money on the theatrical experience. And yet, you know, I was just reminded of it recently in New York because I went to see Top Gun yeah. in the cinema. Blew my mind. It was like... <laughs> Why, why do I sit at home and go, yeah, this is great. I can watch any film I want at home. And I just had, I had, I had my, my pants literally ripped off by that movie because I was like, damn, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So, so movie pass was designed to get more people into cinemas more often because it was a, it was a way of making pricing more manageable, I guess. But I think pricing and figuring out what the right pricing was, was probably, probably the downfall of the company. Is that fair to say? I mean, I don't think they were trying to get the right price. I think they were trying to put it at a price that they knew they could get a lot of people to come into. Um, but there wasn't, it, it, you, you, we've, we've seen the, the downfall of a lot of companies who say, hey, we're just going to get a lot of people in and we'll figure out our financial model later. Well, that works great when you don't have the financial impact uh, like a social media company, like you can do that. And you can say, we're going to negatively cover the cost of our developers 
We're going to get a product up. It's free for people to join. And then when we get scale, we'll figure out how to cover our OPEX. So they kind of went with that playbook. But every time a person went to the movies, it was a full retail price ticket that was being paid. So I don't even think it got as far as let's think of a way to do this. They were just like, let's just grow. Um, and that that didn't make any sense because we had a pretty strong cult following. We were clearly out front. We were getting in close to what the price needed to be uh, for the consumer to win, the theater to win, the studio to win, and us to win. Um, and there is a there there. We just all needed to figure it out. Uh, but I think they they handled it wrong and had a bit of a lead foot in the situation, and it it blew up the ship. So, yeah, and it's such a shame. It, the the you know the the idealistic filmmaker who wants to see you know medium budget or even small budget, which is I guess ten to fifteen million dollar great movies, yeah. hitting the cinemas and having their theatrical run it doesn't happen. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. happen. No, you've got your tent poles, and then everything else is just this unrelenting avalanche of great TV. And you, just, you just can't get away from it. It's insane. So I think there was always a place for movie pass. I was, you know, before Netflix was Netflix, it was DVDs that you mailed in and they mailed to you. What a crazy business model that was. But, you know, right. I, I, I used Love Film, which is the equivalent of that in the UK. So I know that people are prepared to, to, to go there and they love movies. They still love movies. Mm -hmm. So what was it that made you come back to a company that had clearly left a, a, a sour taste in the mouth, but wh why come back? Yeah. So one of the things that was really inspiring was seeing TikTok videos of people saying, Oh, I wish I had movie pass back. Um, and so that was one thing that when we actually ran polls, the, taste that was left of people was a brand that people really loved, an idea that people loved, but somehow, and we've seen this many times, we saw it happen with Apple, we saw it happen with Dell computers and other companies that had these bold ideas. Um, the, the founder's vision got lost and the company went astray, but also in those history, history of those companies, founders returned and the companies actually did quite well uh, in the long run. So I think that there's a, a, a narrative there and there's a history there. And a recent poll was done that more than 50% of all moviegoers are aware of the MoviePass brand. That's north of 100 million people who are aware of the brand. And they didn't have a negative experience. They felt that things went wrong and so there was a little bit of a, a difference and it was, can we relay the message that this is what happened? It wasn't us, the original team, but we're back and we want to rebuild this. And then the second thing is, and you see it uh, with Top Gun breaking uh, Memorial Day weekend records with uh, Minions breaking Fourth of July records. Uh, so literally attendance records are being set. And I always say that going to the movie is the live event of cinema, right? So there's, I could watch a sports game on, on my phone. I could watch a sports game uh, at, at the bar with a lot of people on a giant screen and I can go to the stadium. Well, movie going is like going to the stadium and, and being right there, you know, on the court feeling the energy with a bunch of other people live. And that's the premium experience that everybody wants to emulate. And we felt like it's worth trying to bring that back. Yeah, it, it it's hard to explain to people who haven't been through this process, but when you have made a film and you've suffered for it, because yeah. that's inevitably what happens, and you sat in a mix with an yeah. engineer and heard 5.1, and when when you know that most people won't get that, it's really heartbreaking, but oh, yeah. the cinema is a highly optimized venue these days. Like the seats are incredible. Mm. The sound is incredible. The projectors are incredible. The acquisition mediums now are fully digital and it's easy to send movies to any cinema in the country without having to transport heavy and degradable negatives 
I mean, it, it's like these these are fantastic things. It's a very amazing experience, and I I am just rooting for this to come back, for the cinematic experience to come back because this is my home territory. Yeah. So there there was a bunch of stuff that you learned from the first phase of Movie Pass. What were the things that you were picking up on? What what were you learning from? I mean, I guess there was a bunch of data points, but what was it that gave you the the strength of that business model to pick it up again in this next phase? So when you talked about, uh, I love hearing your journey because um, there's some three facts that that I'll put out there. So uh, there was a study done um, by a company called Mather Economics, and they did a study on MoviePass, and they we partnered with AMC on what's called a double blind study. So we couldn't see. We would put in our data, AMC would put in their data, and neither of us could see the results and they produced a white paper. And if you look for it, you can, you can find it. But it found that movie pass increased movie going by 111% month over month. So if you went to the movie once a month, you would go twice. If you went to the movie twice a month, you would go four times. Nothing in the history of the movie industry got people out. Um, so the, the decision fatigue that happens along the, the, that route, person says, well, let me look up reviews. What did my friend think? It's Friday. What time do I have? What's on Netflix? There's all these decisions that they have to make. What we found with MoviePass was when you already paid at the top of the month in advance, you wanted to get your money's worth. And so to you, the going to the movies became psychologically became free. And so it was like, well, I want to get my money's worth. I already paid for this. I'm going to go. And we saw this giant shift in human behavior. And so movie pass lifted attendance more than 3D, more than recliner seats, more than free Twizzlers. Like there was nothing measurable that increased that kind of lift over a sustained period of time. So that was that was the first thing we discovered that was really cool. Can, second, I, can, can I just jump in and, uh, and just yeah. ask you about demographics there? Yeah. What, what was the split? Because I'm, I'm assuming it was young. Male, female? Yeah, well, no, more, more age group. Age. I'm assuming it was 18 to 25s that were the, the bulk driver of that. Yeah, so uh, our core demo was 75% were under the age of 35. And the average male was 26. The average female was uh, 24. Because I, I keep seeing, well, I, I don't keep seeing, but I, I, I have this this number I think I've seen somewhere that like over 60s are now driving like a lot of cinema visits. Is that is that right? Am I, am I misreading that? But like the, the, old, the old gray pound, as we used to call it in the UK, is <laughs> the thing, you know? <laughs> Well, so, so that goes to a bit of a historical thing that started to happen. So in the 80s and 90s, um, everybody thought, hey, we need to start upgrading the theater. Let's, you know, uh, dine in. So it was like, how do we increase the experience? So there was food and beverage and what they call sight and sound, right? And just like you talked about, 5.1, Dolby, THX, you know, the screen, IMAX, concave, recliner seats. It got to a place that you can't beat that experience. But the way they had to pay for it was they had to increase prices. And so what, what it did was it took people who were doing the experience, it increased their prices. So the, they, everyone started focusing on incremental spend rather than incremental visits. So it was Robin's coming to the theater and let's get him to spend five more dollars, but let's not worry about, can we get him to come more times? And so that's what the industry started focusing on, uh, putting most of its energy. It always focused on frequency, but, but that became the primary driver. So what it did was it started to price out the younger part of the market. And what we found with the movie pass service was people who were in the courtship period of their life, high school, college, post-college, but even if you're married, you don't have kids yet. Those were the core people who signed up for movie pass first. And so 
we found that that was our market. That's what we focused on. But the second point that I think is, will be music to your ears is we saw 50% increase in midweek attendance and we saw a massive increase in art house and um, films that were more independent. So, so what was happening was people were going to the tent poles, but they were using movie pass as their discovery item to see movies that they maybe wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have seen. So most of the art house films that were playing at that time, we were anywhere from 10 to 20% of all sales. I think on Lady Bird, we were 26%. Um, in the New York market, we were the number one seller of tickets on Won't You Be My Neighbor. Um, sorry to bother you, we were 19%. So th it's pretty extraordinary how we were lifting the art house and independent world. We weren't moving the needle on, on the tent pole. Spider-Man and Marvel was going to be fine without us. But we were making a substantive difference in the life of those other films because people psychologically said, I'm going to go for free. Why not check it out? Um, so those were the those were the learnings that we had. And you figure we had more than 50 million movie views over the life of the company. A lot of data, a lot of intelligence, and we knew what worked. And so that's why we decided to bring it back. So <clears throat> one of the funny things about the NFT communities that, that are springing up is that they are very much at the content creation side of things. They are about building communities, writing as a group, creating as a group. If you make films and you have been to, for instance, the Cannes film market and have tried to sell your film there, you are confronted with just an orgy of product. It is yeah. so intimidating. It's almost like you, you just go, well, how can we possibly compete with this? <laughs> getting something seen is, uh, well, you know, selling it, then yeah. getting it seen is one of the most painful things that you can go through, which is why when I saw you speak, I was like, nobody sees this. Yeah. So why were you at NFT NYC? What was the reason for you with MoviePass, which has nothing to do with NFTs, which has nothing to do with Web3? Why were you there? So I think there's certain things about Web3 that um, are in line with our motto, which is cinema needs an upgrade. And our job, we've always viewed it as the same thing, which is we want to take the friction and the distance between the creator and the audience, right? So there's just like what you said, there's so many layers. People have no idea. I think Sundance gets in anywhere from three to 6,000 submissions a year and it'll show 300 and, you know, 10 films will get picked up. I mean, the bloodbath of getting that process done is horrible. And digital filmmaking has not only help flood the market with more bad content. Um, you know, anybody can make a movie, but it, it's, it's made it harder to get through there where, like you said, we see more and more tent poles, uh, big global releases, that that world where new filmmakers are created is harder. So the technology, we feel there's certain Web3 technologies that are leaning themselves to that. Now, I think from, from our standpoint, the NFT side of the universe is more what I think ticketing, promotional items, um, communicating with the audience, rewarding the audience. I look at it in that way. Now, there were some things I sat there and they were showing how you could use NFT to make films. Like, we don't care we're not a movie theater, right? We don't care about that technical aspect, but we saw a lot of, we see a lot of traction around, uh, are you familiar with POAPs, which is proof of attendance oh, yeah. protocol? Okay. Oh yeah. So, so think of it like this. Let's say you say to your audience, hey, if you buy a ticket and you come to the theater, I'm going to release a limited edition number of, whatever's right well now digitally you can confirm that that person went and you can reward your audience 
in a direct way. So for us, NFTs and POAPs have that capability. And so we see a direct correlation with that. Um, there's other theory, things on the blockchain that you're able to do that you couldn't do before. Uh, and so that's why we were there. And that's why we feel like, okay, this is a space that we need to be in if we're going to truly upgrade cinema. I think Web3 is, is where we're supposed to be. And I think it's quite an easy thing for people to wrap their heads around, actually, as well. Yeah. We got into lots of parties in NFT NYC using token gated access, yeah. but also the way you can, you know, airdrop things to people. You can take those po apps and and use them as proof of attendance. My gosh, yeah. what, a, what a powerful thing to know yeah. that your fans who went to see your last movie will see this movie, and actually maybe they'll see this movie as well. And you build that relationship through studios, through so everything else, it could be a much better recommendation system, I think, as That's well, right. which is really, and, and, yeah. And, a, and a, like you said, a relationship where if you decide you're going to make a trilogy and you want to reward everybody who saw it in the first weekend, and if they came back and saw the second installment in the first weekend and then the third installment, I mean, you being able to have a relationship and directly reward them is a very, very, very powerful tool. And um, so our platform with the way our check-in system works, we know that that's something that will be very helpful to filmmakers. And then having this two-way street where we're shortening the, the, the distance for you to be able to communicate with them. And then being able to share data that tells you where they were, where they came from, you know, all of that stuff, instead of you trying to have to manage it on your own. That's that's the power of that market. I had a really interesting conversation with the team who are building all the NFTs for Fox yeah. this week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wild. <laughs> like, you know, they, they were spinning the numbers at me. I was like, yeah, people get mad at 10K PFP collections for being yeah. Yeah. For having too many assets. But like, you know, yeah. the, the uptake for Fox on the WWE NFT collection was like 100,000. Yeah, people signed up for wallets. One hundred thousand. That's still peanuts, but it's like, yeah. nah, this this is this is ready for big time. So yeah. I guess the question that should probably be asked is if can all of the can't all of this be done without using Web three or NFTs? Could you not build a proprietary system and have it kind of private and permissioned on a on your own servers and database? Could you not just go that route because it would probably be cheaper? Um, I mean, you know, the gas fees are coming down. Uh, some of the stuff that Polygon is doing, we're, we're seeing the cost uh, that they're really figuring out how to do these kernels where they're not needing to every single transaction, uh, every single NFT go and mint everything all at the same time. So there's ways to stagger it that we think are going to uh, prove to be valuable. But the amount of data and the amount of intelligence, all that already exists today. But we do think that this is an upgrade and an improvement from where things were before. So, you know, we're not on the side to try and figure out that technology. We're on the side of deployment and how we can use that for the audience to make it better. And I think there's also a curious experience if you remember back in the early days of um, Web 2, as Web 2 was maturing, and you'd see a, a, not just a website, right? So some web, some um, places had put a, a website up or a landing page, and it would just be like a video clip of their trailer, and that was what, what a, a, a movie did. But if you remember things like, that you would start to have these experiences. And I don't know if you ever got to see the Prometheus website. Yes. So do you remember it had, it had um, Waylon giving his TED talk and you went in and you had this whole experience about the new robots that they were creating. I mean, all of that stuff was uh, that, 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 that level of in-depth experience is there well nfts and, and po apps allow you to do ar they allow you to do things that interact with locations in the real world i mean there's so many different things that you can do there it's it takes that next leap just the way web 2 kind of you really started to be able to use at first they were using flash but then the browsers started to be able to do 
all of these integrated experiences that you couldn't do. I think it's a lot of that next evolution because now I can step into the web. I can take the web with me. I can overlay the web with the real world. All that stuff's coming and that you, you couldn't do that before. Well, you talk about experiences. I, I remember Donnie Darko when it came out. <laughs> It had the most incredible online experience. It was this, yeah. I mean, I, I remember it with probably with rose tinted yeah. glasses, but it, yeah. it was a treasure trove of just weirdness. And they put yeah. so much love into that film. It, it really showed the way. And speaking of experiences, we will be speaking to Aaron Haber, who is from Below Board, which is a comedy club in okay. the metaverse. And I'm really curious for you to kind of jump in on this conversation with me because it's it's yeah i think in terms of experiences i think it's probably going to blow your mind and it might make you think about theatrical as well in different ways but like these really rich environments that can exist in the metaverse so before we get into all of that i must first do the sponsors because that's how we pay for all this stuff yes. so we'll be back in about 56 seconds are you building dynamic NFT drops, on-chain DAOs, or complex Web3 applications? Do you need streamlined solutions to deploy pre-built or custom smart contracts without exposing your private keys? ThirdWeb is a free, open-source, and multi-chain developer tool for devs of all skill sets building on the blockchain. In less than seven months, 50,000 developers have launched more than 200,000 projects across the platform. Take advantage of a robust set of front-end and blockchain SDKs, popular UI and UX components, and third web deploy and release. The most secure and streamlined framework for displaying and deploying your custom smart contracts. Third web has powered major brand projects, including NFT drops for global gaming powerhouses, 100 Thieves and Fnatic, and more recently with Boohoo, a global fashion label welcoming its fans into Web3 with the launch of the Boohoo-verse. The future is here. Start building for free on third web today. The future is here. The future is actually the future is in the future. The future. Is the future. What? <laughs> so confusing. Aaron Haver, welcome. Hello. 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 Good, good evening. Am, am good I morning. pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you got yeah. it right. right. I got it Haver. right. Aaron, we're staring at what I can only imagine is just a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of development. But man, it looks epic. So it's built. I can see it's built in Mona. Tell me about this. What are we looking at? You are looking at the Below Board Club. And Below Board is a social and comedy club metaverse, as you said, built on Mona. Um, and it is called Below Board because it uh, exists underneath a certain yacht club, um, <laughs> which might, uh, might uh, have a lot of bored apes in it. Um, this, uh, I, I'm an OG uh, ape minter. And uh, I've, I've diamond handed the ape uh, since uh, May 1st, 21, and uh, decided to use the IP to do something that uh, I love. I've been a comedian for over 30 years. And so I've run comedy venues, I've performed, done all types of stuff. And so I said, well, why not marry my two loves? And since Christina Ricci and uh, Pizza were unavailable at the time, I did comedy <laughs> and uh, NFTs. So there you have the Below Board Club. And actually, so, so can we can we look around the club and get it? Get it? Oh, look, here we go. And who yes, who's who's walking through the club at the moment? Well, this is me. Um, it the, this system uses Ready Player Me in Mona. Um, would you prefer uh, third person or first person? Oh no, the the, the third person gives, it slightly gives you an anchor point to look at. Okay, so. Welcome to the Blowboard Club. Now, believe it or not, this is about 50% of the size that it was before um, the architect and I decided to make it uh, smaller just so that if we have, you know, a thousand people in here, it feels like a thousand people. By the way, I have to give all credit to uh, our Metaverse architect, Faraz Mobin. Um, he is absolutely unbelievable. He's, he's an award-winning architect. And seeing a lot of the Metaverse... Um, Previously, I really didn't know if my vision for a comedy club would be um, would be workable. You know, can we fit as many people in with the experience still, you know, being uh, quality? And then I saw his work. He did a, a space called Andromeda, which was basically a, a sci-fi like dance hall in outer space, and it was just unbelievable. 
as I reached out to him and luckily he was available and uh, it was also important to me to build the space before we launched our project. Uh, so it's not that, hey, in 18 months, we'll uh, buy a plot of land somewhere and, and start on things. Day one, we're ready. Yeah, I think that's a big, big thing, isn't it? We're we we we're get we're gonna buy some land in the sandbox, and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna book, 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 oh voxel oh we need to be oh oh no. So <laughs> the the good thing about this, when I saw it, was there's something so very very primitive about stand up comedy. It's a it's like this very intimate connection between people based on yeah, especially mine, it and it's so it's so kind of connected to just being human that it feels like a very natural fit and a very easy thing to, to bring into the metaverse and get people just laughing because you don't need them to interact with anything they can just laugh and if you can you know you have the same challenges you would have in any comedy club which is if you're not funny then it's going to be a painful night but if you are funny then what a vibe and what an atmosphere and i think what what so many metaverse experiences lack is that social element it's like, how do we bring people together? Stacey Eddy was talking about cinemas as a communal experience. And there is, there's no doubt that the best type of film to see in the cinema is horror. Because if you, <laughs> laugh, if, if you, if you are frightened together, then what immediately follows the fright is that you laugh because you, you say, oh, I'm being stupid for, for, for being scared of this. And that, that, that double hit of kind of physical you know, and mental emotions, it, it, it's, it's unbeatable. It's the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning. I, I love it. So this is a this is a massive, massive venue. Well, and this is um, one room, by the way. Of course, there's a shady back club, back room somewhere where you know there's cigars <laughs> and, and and whiskey <laughs> going on. And by but, the way, I have to say, when I lived in New York, I was a movie pass holder. Oh, and, excellent! And I definitely my my father worked in the movie uh, industry for decades. I never paid for a movie, and then when he uh, left the industry. And I started to, I was like, this is very painful. And the movie pass came along and I was like, this is less painful. That's awesome. So Aaron, the, the, the mission of the comedy club is what exactly? Is it literally just to get people to come and be present at comedy events in the metaverse? Or is there, is there more beyond that? We have two whys for the Blowboard project. And the first is to bring real comedy to the DGENs of Web3. And so what I mean is um, comedy club comedy. I mean, we will do Zoom shows, which have now become pretty uh, commonplace, but we're also going to live stream from the clubs, which is quite a different experience than if you're watching comedy on television. Um, even if you're watching it at home, even if you're just in the metaverse with people, it's still very different to watch comedians perform uh in front of a live audience and it's it's just it's more raw it's more of a conversation it's a bit less polished than you than you see on tv which is quite often edited so that's one of the whys is to bring comedy to the metaverse in a major way the second why is to bring comedians to the metaverse because when i contact my comedian friends we talk on facebook um they don't know what web3 is uh, so it's this is something where you know, I've been in the space since early 2021 and the conversations were very much um, about artists and about the revolution that was happening for artists, secondary sales, aka okay, royalties, um, you know, getting your work out to a, a new audience. And comedians are not really enjoying that at this point yet. And I want to help them. I want to help to get them educated. So every comedian that performs at our club gets paid. But they also get paid in a membership to the club because we want them to hang out with our members. And they also get paid with um, regular seminars on Web3 NFT education. It's, I mean, I love it. I, I, I genuinely do. I think it's such a neat fit for these early foothills of, of the metaverse. But I want to put it to Stacey. Like, what, what do you make of all of this? Have you seen much stuff like that? And do you have a, a view on the metaverse at all? Yeah, you know, I've spent a lot of time in places like uh, the uh, big screen, which is the movie theater metaverse app. Um, and Aaron, I had a question. So what's it like telling jokes? Um, you know, that what, what's that feeling, that difference between 
I'm not there with people, but I'm in this different world that no one's ever experienced. What's that? What's what does that feel like? It's not as new of an experience for me because one, when I would tell jokes in person in front of an audience, there was silence. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, there's not silence actually here. You know, there are different levels that the audience can experience with you, and there's different levels that the comedian can experience depending on how proficient they are. So actually in 2015, I opened the world's first uh, fully online comedy club out of um, Los Angeles. doesn't really matter where it was from. And we streamed comedians from all over the world to audiences all over the world. And at that point, um, there was really no audience with the comedians. It was just them performing to their cameras and not getting a reaction. And that was very tough for the comics. Here, either through our metaverse um, or through just sort of some Web2 technologies or uh, performing in front of a live crowd that's being uh, live streamed, they will have a ton of feedback uh, from the audience. In fact, one of my friends, um, Andy, who I uh, just asked last night or a couple days ago, hey, I'm booking some uh, you know paid online gigs, which is how I approach comedians because I don't want to have their heads explode. And then I get more into it as we go on. And his questions were, will I be able to hear an audience, you know, amongst others? And so I explained the process to him and he's like, yeah, I'm in. This is great. What do you do about hecklers? Well, it depends. It depends on where the heckler is. So our, um, we don't have a lot of rules for the club. All drugs are legal. You can wear whatever you want to. I mean, it's the metaverse. So what difference does it make? You know, the metaverse police aren't going to come and arrest you for taking fake drugs, right? Um, and what you do in your own home, we don't know about anyway, unless you tell us. Right. So um, with hecklers, I mean, if they are on the feed with the comedian, which we do allow them uh, to be, so that maybe you can see their face, you can see their avatar, whatever they want to show. If they're heckling, we just kick them out. Um, no, I mean, you know, by the way, there's different levels of heckling. I, I know that everybody, like, loves heckling and thinks it's amazing but it's not quite as amazing as as you'd think it, it ruins a lot of shows but there are different types of hecklers right there are some hecklers that i've experienced that have good timing and they're funny so if that's the case me as a comedian i'll let them fly if they don't interrupt my punchlines or my jokes or my flow then there are others who are just drunk and belligerent who are just screaming and those you kind of give one warning to and then you kick them out and so it'll be no different here you either play with somebody who has um, good intentions, although we don't recommend doing that uh, for the, the audience to be hecklers, or um, host controls is so easy, you kick them out. Back, back in New York City, I would have to like lift people out of rooms and throw them out of the venue. Uh, right. Here, I just press a button and they're muted and then they're gone. All right, so Robin, can I ask one more question to Aaron? Yeah, yeah absolutely, go for it. So I'm, I'm in the West Village in New York, so all of the comedy clubs are there and, and love going to them. So much of a, the beginning of the routine has a lot to do with who's in the audience and maybe interacting and joking with the audience and what this guy's wearing or where did you two come from? So what, do you, what, what ways can the comedians interact in that way uh, like you normally would in a, in a comedy club? Well, well, first of all, West Village, you've got one of the best comedy clubs in the world, which is the Comedy Cellar. Yeah. Um, that is probably one of the, if not the best comedy club in the world, one of them. It's, it's legendary. So that, yeah. that's great. It's a great place to be. Um, so I would push back a little bit as a guy who's a, a comedian who's taught comedy at university level and say that the beginning of sets should not be that actually you're talking about crowd work. Yeah. And yeah. so now comics will do it sometimes, but it's at a, a huge risk of um, not having it go the way they want. Right. And so professional comics, mostly they might say like, Hey, how you doing? Or something to that effect. But they usually start with their first joke. Even if you don't know it's their first joke, um, the best comedians don't, they don't tell jokes as if like, there are some one-liners who, why the chicken cross the road, you know, that kind of thing. But when I, when I tell jokes, generally people won't know I am until I get to the punchline because I have done it for a long time. I make it conversational. So you start off with your, your best joke first. You might get away with uh, ah, good to be at the club, whatever. 
but then you go right into your set because you need to establish that yeah. you're really funny right up top. Otherwise, people will stop listening to you. So the really good comics will get right into their set. Um, or if they're just messing around up on stage for that set, maybe that they'll start with crowd work. But crowd work generally comes in later. And some comedians trick you where you think they're doing crowd work, but it's just a bit and they aren't even listening yeah. to the audience. Yeah. And, yeah, so, and yeah. some do it you know, properly. That's great. Okay, so um, I have a, a question for you, which is participation in the metaverse is dismal. How do you get people to, to participate? How do you get them to, to not do Netflix? Weekly orgies. <laughs> um, it might work for a certain main... segment. Um, my yeah. wife would have a problem with it. So how are you going to get me? How are you going to lasso me in and, and pull me in? Well, she can watch the comedy show at the same time. I mean, <laughs> we understand that orgies aren't for everybody. Um, but they should be. This, yes. I mean, this should be a place where all communities can come and hang, right? You can show up um, as your avatar. Right now we use Ready Player Me, but pretty soon we'll be using uh, Mona's proprietary system where you can sort of wear the skin of your, your favorite PFP and even your wearables. Um, and so part of, uh, part of the club is definitely the programming. Comedy, uh, music performances, um, you know, even movie screenings, other things. But um, a big part of it is just the social aspect of the club. This, you'll notice in the beginning, I said a social and comedy club. So I've been a, I was a member of the Friars Club in New York, which Stacey may have heard of, yeah. um, for about a decade. I produced comedy shows there and, and was a member there. And yeah, you would go and see an event every once in a while. But mostly you would go there to hang out with your fellow Friars. And you never know who you would meet there. I met some very, very interesting people and some very boring people. But, you know, met people and you hung out. And it's really the same thing here where you can come and, and sort of like, why do people hang out uh, on a Discord? Why do people hang out in a, you know, in a, in a Twitter spaces? So it'll be the same thing. Um, and then for the shows, the shows are time sensitive. So we do not record the shows. Um, you, you watch them, you've seen them. If you don't watch them, you don't see them. And so for those times in particular, uh, people will want to go uh, to be there. But I think the, the basic answer is you make it really fun and enjoyable for people. Which is, again, it's an easy thing to say. Yes, but I, it was very easy for me to say. It was very easy to say. And I, I've spent quite a lot of time wandering around different metaverses. And I, I spend, I force myself to spend time in VR using my Oculus because I think it's going to be the platform by which a lot of people will discover the metaverse, I'm sure, or at least a version of it. But again, it's, I mean, what is fun in the metaverse? Because I don't think it's the same thing as fun in, you know, a regular bar. So have you tested that? Have you? Have you got people in there and done games with them? And because I suspect you're probably as, as adept at understanding an audience and getting them to do things with you as anybody could ever be. So that's why I'm curious whether you've thought about how to, to, to take that audience experience when people aren't rooted to a seat and they can wander around and they can be all over the place and they can talk whenever you, they want. How, how are you going to manage that and make it still fun? Well, we have, um, we have host controls. And I, I shared another uh, screen if you want to bring it up of one of our other spaces. Um, we we have host control. So in terms of like, if people are calling out or, or heckling or something like that, we'll be able to pinpoint who it is and, and remove them because while they may be having a good time, the rest of the audience probably isn't based on what they're doing. Stacy, you've been to a lot of comedy shows. It sounds like 10% of the time when a heckler is engaging, it's fun, but there's a lot of times right. you don't see the YouTube videos of the heckler just ruining the show. Right. You know? Right, right. So a lot of times security just brings them out and we'll do that too. I have the experience of running uh, hundreds, if not thousands of online uh, comedy shows. And so in terms of how to host them, how to uh, produce the show and, and schedule the comedians. Um, and yeah, we'll be doing tests beforehand, you know, almost stress tests on Mona where we bring a ton of people in, see how they act. In fact, um, we're going to be presenting the first metaverse minting experience where we have uh, put together a minting room that everyone can come into and then they can be uh, transported to, you know, their their wallet connect and and mint from there. 
as well. And as a team, we've talked about just what you're saying now. Well, what if somebody is coming in and kind of uh, being a jerk and we'll be present and, and there and, and uh, sort of helping to manage the room, but hopefully it's just a fun experience. Am I right in thinking that Mona will be VR capable at some point? Mona will be VR capable, but also I want to say that um, we're not just a Mona NFT. Uh, Mona is the platform that we've decided to start with. Uh, we think they're great. We're also going to be opening up a spatial space, which um, spatial is, is good. It's not quite Mona, but they do have VR capability and they're mobile optimized right from the get go. So for our members that, um, you know, aren't uh, browser based, they don't have uh, they don't they don't have a, a, a laptop or a computer at all. They'll still be able to enjoy the show. And we also plan on opening uh, an other side and being the first ape owned comedy club once, um, you know, Animoca, <clears throat> you know, lets us start to build. And, yeah. and some of the members of, of their team have seen the space and we're very excited about us coming over. So when we talk about metaverse, it's not it really shouldn't be like, hey, this is the one place that my avatar goes. Here's one NFT. We will have rooms from the main club to all of our different platforms and metaverses and if you have all of the uh nfts in the same wallet it should just be a seamless experience of you teleporting from one metaverse to the next so i guess the question is now we have stacy on the show can there be a movie pass that unites all of these kind of premium metaverse experiences as well as cinema ones and in real life and everything else because it feels like what movie pass is about is allowing people to experience a rich variety of things that they probably wouldn't necessarily go to, but that they feel that they, they can, they're empowered to. It feels like a good fit, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to project your business for you, but it, this is kind of why I wanted you guys on the same stream. I think it's a really interesting thought experiment. Yeah, I know uh, when we looked at it, we found that when you give someone like, let's say it's a comedy pass or it's a movie pass or once you get people around a certain habit, it might be they want to do salsa dancing, but the pass actually is a um, passport into that world that lets them sample things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, and so I, we, we know that psychologically it works, especially when people get into a major vein. And so Aaron should probably look at getting into a comedy pass if, if he ever wants to rise up and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pull this together and get more people into the overall space. Like he leaves just doing his venues. Um, but we found it to be effective. I mean, it's, it's subscriptions around certain sectors work very well. So yeah, I, I see it in the future. So I just want to finish now on your manifesto, the AF paper, the boring AF paper. <laughs> So, Aaron, I mean, it, it's, it's got a certain kind of sass to it. <laughs> did you write I'm definitely this? keeping my – I did write it um, with help from our uh, community manager and our project manager. But it's written in my voice, which, um, you know, I don't know what the rating is here, so I've been keeping it clean. But, oh, yeah, I, it's not – Well, sometimes, sometimes the F words come out and then, you know, my kids watch this, but they're so – they're so immune to it now because my math is filthy. What I, what yeah, well, I, you know, it's, which are boring as fuck paper, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. Um, um, and you know, you yeah. like, in addition to all the shit listed already, this is a project that has legs. I, right. I think it genuinely does have legs. You can rent out the club for whatever you want. And we've seen the club and you should definitely go and check it out as soon as possible. There's a trailer on your Twitter as well that's just like, I <laughs> saw it. I was like, damn. Because there's, there's builds in the metaverse and then there's builds in the metaverse and like your architect, as you said, did an amazing job. You're going to be doing one of comedy shows and concerts, metaverse wearables, box office from real life events as well, brand sponsorships and on and on till the break of dawn. Um, yeah. Well, we're in a bear market, you know, I mean, I, I've been here through the bull. We're now in a bear market, possibly crypto winter. Right. And so you can't have a strategy of going to mint, hoping it sells out, and hoping over a robust secondary. I mean, yeah, of course, uh, everybody hopes that happens, but what if it doesn't? So we're not reliant upon Web3 numbers. I mean, that's the most, that's where our heart is, but 
I also ran a comedy club in Times Square for seven years. Um, I ran it during the recession. It was fine. We didn't make as much, but we did pretty well because people like comedy. Um, we are going to have Web3 revenue uh, streams, Web2 revenue streams, and in real life revenue streams uh, as well. And what that's going to do is once the bull comes back, great. Then um, we have all the formulas from the last bull. And we'll have all the formulas from the bear that we survive. And I already have all the formulas for in real life events and, and a lot of web too. I was a live streamer for quite a long time. So um, that's why I say the thing has legs because we're not, in fact, with our mint, we are a 10K project. We're only opening up the mint for a few hours. We know that we're not a, a normal PFP project. Maybe we sell out in six minutes. Maybe it takes longer. But if you want a membership, you've got to get in pretty quickly. And then we're going to close it off not burn the collection, but then open it up again when we feel like the time is right. So we're a little bit of a different project. When is that mint actually happening if people want to participate? <clears throat> it is going to happen on August 9th. And this is actually the first, yeah. this is the first uh, place I'm, I'm uh, saying that. Uh, it's going to be, uh, we just decided last night. Everything is done. The club is built out. You've only seen about 20% of the club. The club is fully built out, built out and ready to go contract is deployed and tested ready to go everything is pretty much ready we're just um, taking a little bit more time uh to build a couple of more things for people that we haven't even spoken about yet Ooh, alpha um <laughs> stacy i know it's early days for you but what are the next steps for movie pass for you to, to take it into this next beautiful evolution yeah, so we're still we're looking at the bringing the beta back out, and that will be before Labor Day. Um, so we'll start in a few markets with the new model, and then start to expand it as we troop towards the fall, and then get this thing back up and running to its uh, where it was and where it should be, and um, keep expanding from there. Sounds awesome. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Do you have any last questions for? Aaron, before we sign off, Stacy. No, just good luck. I think it's exciting being so close to all of these New York comedy clubs. I, I can see the appeal of it easily. So good luck. Well, thank you, Stacy. And listen, if you need help with that beta, you just let me know because I have done so many betas that people have nicknamed me the master beta. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Pum, pum. That's Actually, what he said. Aaron, Aaron before, before we go, did, did, you, did you participate in the load test for the other side? Did you jump in on that? I did. What was, I mean, I did the first one. I don't know how insane the second one was, but the first one was, was bananas. It, it was. And if that's a sort of taste of how things are going to be on the other side, I think we, this is going to be interesting. It's it's going going to be, be interesting. The, the test was great, and I had my five-year-old with me, and he just thinks it's a game yeah, because he's used to Roblox. Of course. And so he was like, can I play that game again? He loves coming into our uh, club. He says, Daddy, can I play the game? <sighs> and I know what he's talking about. Yes. And, uh, and generally, he wants to go hang out with the alligator in the green room. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure my own kids are going to go nuts. Right? They, they also they can't. Well, they basically killed my phone from playing Roblox so much on it. It doesn't yeah. work anymore. Exactly. Um, well, listen, thank you, both of you. It's Aaron Huber from Below Board and Stacey Spikes from the Rejuvenating movie pass thanks so much for joining me and uh best of luck with the projects thanks robin thanks nice to meet you, Aaron. Nice to meet you too stacy that's where we end the show goodbye <laughs>